Field, how are you? I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm doing okay. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to um, to join us today. We know you're really, really busy. And so it's um, not lost on us that you took some time to join us today. Hey, I would most likely wear a college shirt, but I'm on my way to a protest. So. Of course. Of course you are. And no, no worries. No worries. Um, thank you again for joining us. It's an important conversation. And, and we know that we have to have it. We know that you've been a really Big supporter and advocate, a very passionate advocate for us, and and um and so we just want to talk. We want to talk about the equitable funding that our students need and deserve. So we'll jump in some introductions and give you uh, some time to talk about the things that you've been doing, like the protest you're heading to, the one that I saw you at on Sunday. Um, didn't get a chance to get over to you, but we we know that you've been very busy. A lot of people on the line today and are looking forward to having the conversation with you. I'll start with myself, Shelly Hicks, Community Engagement Manager for the New Haven region with Connecticut Charter Schools Association. We also have a few other folks from Connecticut Charter Schools Association on the line. Ru Ruben Felipe, who I'm sure you know, our Executive Director. Karen Needhart, our Director of Schools and Community Engagement. We have um, some folks from our schools across New Haven. I will let you all introduce yourselves and, um, and then we'll, we'll come back to Senator Winfield. I'll call on you each. We'll start with um, Highville Charter School and I will introduce our executive director, Janet Brown Clayton. Janet is on the line. She was not going to miss this conversation, but she cannot talk. Um, as well as she would like to right now. And so we're gonna give her voice some rest, but Jana is on the line. We also have Ebony West, Director of uh, Schools and School Operations. Ebony, did you like to have a word? Yes, I am the Director of School Operations here at Highville. I'm also a parent of a student here at Highville and Amistad High School. So I represent Charter all over. And both- and Okay. No, I was just saying, and both in your district, Senator Winfield. Yes, and um, I've been with charter schools for nine years now. Thank you, Ebony. We also have Esther. You're, you're muted, Esther, Director of Finance. Technology. Um, afternoon. Hi, Senator Winfield. Uh, Director of Finance for Highville Charter School, um, and also like Ebony, I worked at uh, Achievement First as well, so haven't quite been in the charter school world as long as her, but for about three years. Thank you. And we've got another uh, Achievement First connection, a Amasad High School alum, and also a... Hi, Amy. Oh, uh, hello, my name is Jamie. Um, I graduated from AF in 2016. Um, I started out with the organization in 2008. I just graduated from college this year. Um, so this is my 12th year being with AF, so I'm happy to be on the call. Yes, on the ground, uh, family on the call. We have another student, Darlene. Darlene is a rising senior. Hi, I'm Darlene. Uh, I'm a rising senior for Common Ground, and I just appreciate being part of this conversation we're having right now. Hi, I'm Monica Machera Filco. I'm the executive director of Common Ground in New Haven, and I'm also appreciating appreciate your time, Senator Winfield. Great. We have uh, Booker T. Washington family on the line. John Taylor, executive director, Senator. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, and we also have one other uh, parent and community member, Linda Baylor. It says above average, and that's a, a company that she's working with, but she just joined our call as well. I'm not sure if Linda is able to talk. I know she was working right now. Linda, are you there? All right, so Linda Baylor, she's a parent at Highville Charter School. She's also a chair of the board of directors and um, is at work. And so she, she may not be able to interact as much, but wanted to make sure that she joined the call. And we have Senator Winfield. Uh, Senator Winfield represents 
the 10th district. He's chair of Judiciary Committee. He sits on the Education Committee, the Appropriations Committee, and Public Safety Committee, and has been really, really busy in the community. Uh, many of us have watched uh, the Facebook Lives that the BPRC, the town halls that you guys have put on, have seen you in the community at different marches and protests, and, and know that you have been working really hard for our community. And I want to give you some, um, some time to, to talk a little bit about that. And before we do, we also have our lobbyist, uh, Aurora Melita. I know that you know Aurora. Um, one, Aurora has a few words. Hi, Senator. How are you? Doing well. It's good to see you, although I feel like I have seen you all over Facebook every night. So, uh, but it's nice to have you in this conversation. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, you know, whenever we're at the Capitol and we have uh, our charter students there for an advocacy day, whether you have two or three committee meetings or whatever you have going on, you always make time to talk to our students. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, we really appreciate your voice and your advocacy. Uh, you know, our public charter schools have created an educational community that supports you know, the traditionally un underserved students uh, across Connecticut. And we're really thankful that you took the time to have this conversation with us, to talk to the students that, you know, like I mentioned, you always make time for, talk to our educators, folks in our communities. Um, you know, we're scared. We're scared moving forward. We don't know what the world's gonna look like. And um, so we wanted to take the time to share with you our personal stories to, to secure you know, we want to do whatever we can to secure that line item um, that supports our charter schools, that enables them to help folks uh, that really need it. So I just want to say thank you um, and look forward to having this conversation. Great. Thank you, Aurora. Senator Winfield, um, we'll turn it over to you. We know that this is not something that's new to you. You're not just speaking out during this pandemic. You amplify your voice for many issues that are affect our community, um, not just now, but always. You and I have had conversations in the Capitol and I echo Aurora in say, saying that um, you have been a big supporter of ours. You have uh, spoken up for us and in support of us to the leadership. Um, and so we, um, we thank you for that. and wanna just give you some time to talk about the things that you've been doing in the community most recently and also um, how we can support you. Uh, well, how you can support me is by doing the type of thing you're doing right now. Uh, the, the work uh, really, this is what you see in the community, but the work that I do really takes place in, at the Capitol, right? And um, in order for me to do that work, um, I need other people who are receptive to whatever message uh, that I have. Um, so the way that that happens is not by any magical thing that I do, but it's by the advocacy work of a lot of people, including yourself, on this issue and others. Uh, for the last, um, how many months are we at this point? I don't even know. Uh, but since my birthday, March 11th, which was the last day we were at the Capitol, um, you know, we've been home uh, and the legislature hasn't actively been a part of what's going on. But early on, it was apparent to me, maybe because of Black, I don't know, uh, that this issue would have a disproportionate impact on communities. And so um, I immediately came out uh, questioning the Department of Corrections and Department of Public Health on some of the things that were going on. Um, and I guess in some ways that was fortunate because people know I've been working, right? Because I've been in the middle of a lot of uh, news stories and, and, and the like. Um, and so that was the, really the struggle for a couple of months, trying to get... Um, People who have loved ones in our prisons, some answers, trying to get some answers for people in nursing homes. My wife works in a nursing home. So um, that issue is is extremely close to us, right? I've seen the uh, kind of movie-esque uh, magical role that she does coming in the house, trying to get undressed and get the clothes off and put them somewhere and not infect people in the house. And, and I just know what that really is. And I know that government... <laughs> government was saying something different than what the actual experience was. And, and that's not unique for, for these communities, right? Government often has something to say that is different than the actual experience. And then we had, um, 
you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had um, George Floyd and the incident there, the, the murder um, plastered over our TVs and social media. Um, and this is uh, work that I've done for a long time. I remind people of my activism goes back to 28 years ago. And when, when I started my activism, we were a year post Rodney King. And um, people are now saying, you know, we're seeing things we've never seen before, which by the way, they've been saying every time we've seen these things. But we saw Rodney King and that was before my, my activism started. Um, and before that, we heard people saying what was going on, we just refused to listen, we, you know, and I'm trying to get people to, to, rec to contextualize what's going on because I think a lot of people really believe that this moment is necessarily different than other moments. Um, and I think if we rely too much on that, we won't get out of it what we should be getting out of it. Um, and so I think that's, that's what the work is as someone who has been uh, involved for a long time, going almost, you know, <laughs> you already completed a third decade of advocacy work. I think that part of what happens when you become senior in this work is to, to, to say to people, it would be nice if you were correct about the fact that this is unique, but it's not as unique as you think. If you think about um, some of the, the things that went on in the 60s, because people say, no, this is a, a more sustainable thing than we've ever seen before, but um, you know, people boycotted buses for a very long time, right? We forget about that. Um, you know, you had all kinds of parts of the movement that we glance over and don't really think about what it meant what the time spent was. Um, and so I'm just saying to people, I rem and I'll finish up here. I remember Occupy Wall Street. And I remember nobody was going home till <laughs> the whole system was fixed. People went home, you know what I mean? Uh, and so I, I am hopeful that we do something different, but I am trying to tell a lot of my uh, young, strong, uh, very energetic, uh, leaders of the day that you have to be prepared to be here in 10 years, right? You have to be prepared to be here in 15 years and sit in a place like me and say, well, 20 years ago when I was doing this work, I don't like it. I hate it. But that's what you have to be prepared for if you want to actually make change. Um, and so I'll end there except to say one thing that I think is important. I hope that this moment is different, both as it relates to COVID and um the issues of police accountability and police violence, because uh, I like to remind people that my wife has a dream that my mother had, her mother had, and her mother had, and that's the dream that her their children would be treated as fully human and equal in America. And I don't want my daughters to dream that dream. And right now they're on the track to do so. So. Thank you, Senator Winfield, thank you for that. Um, there are so many mothers that have that dream. I am a mother of a teenager who has that dream. And um, there are mothers that are here in this meeting that have that dream. There are um, school leaders who, who act as mothers and fathers who, who have that dream. Um, and, and we feel like we um, are, we, we had hoped that we were moving in a direction uh, for equitable funding for our students and so that our students could be treated as equal. Um, and we know that our charter schools are, are educating a, a large majority of um, students in our, in our state. Connecticut charter schools are serving almost 11,000 students and 80,000, 80% 80 of those close to 11,000 students are black and brown students and 60 or close to 65 percent of of those close to 11,000 students come from low income homes and they're doing what they have to do they're performing um they are in a lot of cases uh overwhelmingly outperforming some of their peers and they're doing it um at the expense of their school leaders pulling away from some other jobs that they could be doing because they're they're uh, looking for funding and they're soliciting donors and donations from other places. And 
And we know that COVID um, has pulled funds from a lot of places and, and put a burden on, a financial burden on a lot of things. And they can't sustain that. Our, our families can't sustain um, maybe sacrifices. Our schools can't uh, sustain it. And so we saw the governor's um, midterm budget and it, it looked like there was um, a cut to our charter school line item. Um, in the tune of $4.6 million. And I don't believe that our charter schools would be able to, um, to successfully operate, but we have some, some folks that are here on the call. And I, I know that you would love to hear from, from them to talk about how that might impact their schools, um, the students, how that might impact their education, parents, what that would do for their, their, their homes. If there are some programs that you know, they're really taking advantage of. I, I, I'm sure that you would love to hear that. Um, so, you know, feel free. Let's hear, you know, I know Monica has a really hard stop because her daughter is graduating today. Congratulations. Congratulations. Um, yes. So Monica, we'd love to hear from you and from Darlene um, about the, the Common Ground community. Sure. Darlene, do you want, do you want me to start? And Great. Um, we really believe in common ground, a common ground about supporting um, all of our students' needs, and we know that that is about like high quality education and a lot of other things. And we've invested a ton of um, human capacity, emotional energy, and money in supports, student supports. So students at Common Ground, in addition to their academic learning, um, our learning is interdisciplinary. Our um, we've developed new curriculum that really weave in systems of anti-racism and fighting systems of oppression and focus a lot on developing um, our students' voice. And I know Darlene can talk about that. Um, and I think we did a pretty good job in distance learning, not perfect, but because we had so many student support systems built in, and I'm really scared, as Shari said, about what would happen if we lose funding, especially in a year where we're about to take on even more cost, right? We're gonna purchase more PPE, we're gonna to have to think about staffing differently, nurses, there's so many additional costs that COVID brings at a time when our kids need even more. Um, and so I, I guess I just want you to know that we really um, are working to change what education can be for our kids and are really deeply working hand in hand with our community to learn and understand what um, our kids need to be successful in, in many ways, in addition to academics, um, and we would just really need the, um, to, the, to minimally be able to maintain our funding so that we can, you know, do that. And we do. I mean, I, I, you, you mentioned, Shelly, we spend a um, significant amount of our money fundraising. Common Ground High School needs to raise close to a million dollars a year to be able to operate, um, and that's not just Common Ground High School. You know, we also have the, the other side of our programming, which you're familiar with, the farm and the camps and all that stuff, so I'm not counting that. Um, but just to be able to operate, we need to raise a million dollars a year to meet our kids' needs. Um, and I do spend a significant amount of my time doing that. I'm fortunate to be able to. Um, but but um, it's, it's what they need. So I'd love to hear, have Darlene share briefly. I know there's a lot of other folks on the call, but you know, share a little bit about what your experience at Common Ground has been and, and some of the ways that, that, you're, um, that you see the the wraparound services supporting you and your classmates. Yeah, so hi, I'm Darlene. Uh, I'm a rising senior at Common Ground. Uh, I am immensely just devoted to Common Ground and the community it brings. And I just, I can go on and on and brag about Common Ground. It's just such an incredibly great place. Like it's, I've met the best people I've, like came across so many opportunities that like, honestly, I would hold so close to my heart, like futures and futures. Like I sometimes even try to like get people to come and come around. Like, have you heard of Common Ground? You should, you should go to Common Ground. It's just such an amazing community that I'm so grateful to be a part. Um, Common Ground really cares about its students and you can see that through the curriculum, through just the community, it's just the people there are so amazing. Um, the lack of funds, I know um, from the students' perspective, from my perspective, it's, 
I know we had uh, difficulties in the past year about the funds, like um, Green Jobs Corps, we had a cut. Um, I know um, Ms. Crystal, the head of Green Jobs Corps, had a cut. Unfortunately, some people had to decrease the number of students working there because the funding was like wasn't there. I know that if we had the lack of funds, lots of our curriculums are based on hands-on experiences, field trips, um, so I know that would be cut and I know lots of students, especially me, I'm a hands on learner. So I know if like those opportunities are cut. I'm, I'm gonna struggle because it's just I, I need that, you know, it's like, it's like fun. It's engaging. Some students love it. Um, but yeah, I know the lack of funds, especially now since um, Miss Monica said it's COVID-19. Lots of students need more support structures. I know me like I know for distance learning, I am terrible at math. So I like how distance learning, we have lots of support structures set up for students who need the support so they can succeed during this time. Um, but yeah, like I said, I can go on and on about Common Ground, but there's lots of people, other, other people here that um, also want to talk. So yeah. Thank you. Darlene and, and Darlene and Senator Winfield, uh, I will also just make the, the note that you guys had a conversation last year at the Appropriations Committee hearing when Darlene came up to testify. We have another dynamic uh, young person on our line, Jamie, who is a graduate of uh, Amistad High School in New Haven and, and recent college grad. So Jamie, can you talk a little bit about the programs at Amistad High that you experienced and benefit from? Sure. Um, so I graduated Amistad High School um, in 2016, so four years ago, and um, Amistad has always just been a really um, impactful part of my, you know, academic trajectory, um, you know, my professional life, um, and, you know, I, I enrolled in at Amistad in 2008 when I was in fifth grade, but I actually got lucky, so um, I was on the wait list. I was attending Wexley Grant Community School, which is right there on, on Dixwell. And, you know, about October, you know, I, my parents get a phone call that like a seat opened up and, you know, I could go to Amistad because I was on the wait list. Um, and to think about, you know, kids shouldn't have to get lucky to break being disenfranchised. Um, and, you know, I get really emotional talking about this because, <clears throat> There are so many students, you know, in New Haven, sorry, um, you know, who are really um, trying to, to beat the odds and, and be better. So to think that, you know, I wouldn't be where I am without Amistad and to be, to not have this, you know, be where I am, go to college and have all these experiences, you know, should my school have not been there for me you know, really breaks my heart. Um, and I talk to kids every day who don't have opportunities to go to Amistad and attend voucher programs. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time. I'm sorry to break down like this, but um, I really just want to advocate for so many kids who just don't have opportunities like me. And, you know, kids in New Haven are like grinding, you know, trying to go to private schools and trying to get into, you know, all these amazing schools. And so it's like, it really takes you know, the people like this on this phone call, you know, our state legislators to really say, you know, people like Jamie had a chance, but more people like her, more people like Darlene, um, you know, deserve a way in. And it shouldn't be that we're, we're disenfranchised or that we're not included in budgets, um, but it should be that the people in our communities want to take an investment on us and that our state legislators care about kids in our communities, care about parents, care about, um, you know, the criminal justice program, like how many students are trying to get back into education after dealing with, you know, retention, and all these things. So I'm really just here to advocate for kids, you know, all across the state that I know that are really trying to make a difference. So I appreciate everyone on this phone call being here. I'm sorry to break down like this, but um, I'm really here to just to really explain that. So thank you guys. Hey, Jamie, if, if I might, um, you, you really shouldn't apologize. Uh, you know, I didn't have a charter school, but I didn't go to my neighborhood school either, because if I went to my neighborhood school, you would not be talking to me. Um, we pretended like we lived in a different part of the Bronx than where I lived in, uh, and I got to go to a better school. Not the best school ever, right, but a better school. And the school has a lot to do with 
how, the fact that I'm sitting here with you. So if, if you experience any part of that and you don't have emotions around it, I don't understand you. So don't, don't apologize for that. It, it just makes sense. Thank you so much. <laughs> Exactly. Jamie never apologized for that. I had a very, very similar conversation with a friend of mine this morning just about my educational journey and the opportunities that I had and and that she had and how we would not have been where we are had we not had um, access to, to the type of education that we did. And so I commend you for being here. I commend you for coming back and having the conversation because you graduated from high school and now college, and you, you find it, you find that much value in it, and so I appreciate it. Um, I really do. We have Mr. Taylor from Booker T, um, who a lot of the the families that uh, attend Booker T Elementary and Middle uh, come from from the tenth district. Yeah, and Senator, this will probably be one of the few times I come to you and say, I'm not asking for anything more. Normally, we're asking for an increase in funding. I'm just saying, uh, let us let us keep the status quo, uh, because there's there's some real concern, and I'm gonna try to quantify it. Um, right now, I'm just looking at the additional expenses that we're going to have to incur to reopen, uh, which include um, everything from the PP, PPEs and additional wipes, infrared thermometers, face shields. We have to get an LPN for the middle school because there's a requirement now to have a nurse in each building. Um, we have to pay for summer program this year uh, to sort of mitigate the learning loss for students that weren't engaged during distance learning. So for us personally, we, we, we um, anticipate having to spend about $356,000 more than we would have in a normal circumstance, mm -hmm. which for us is about $741 a student. Uh, which is that that's crazy. Um, and this is the perfect storm because at the same time, uh, you know, corporation got hit hard and a lot of our philanthropy uh, are given less. Uh, they're not in a position to give it as much. Their revenue is down. So this is a really tough spot to be in. We normally have to raise about $600,000 a year to break even. This year it's going to be over a million. And if this line isn't protected and we end up uh, taking another hit, which probably will end up being for us somewhere around $210,000. Now we got to raise $1.2 million in this current climate. So these are very scary times. Uh, it's already tough uh, as a charter school to do what we, what we need to do for students with, with so much less. Uh, this could be a death blow for a lot of us. Um, we're, our, to, to our staff's credit, they've already agreed to stay flat with their salaries uh, going into the next year. Is, and we saved a couple hundred thousand dollars by doing that. So we're doing everything on our end to try to help mitigate uh, these concerns, but, but it will be super helpful. If we can just keep the, our current status, we won't complain and we, and we will remember you forever uh, <laughs> for supporting us in this work um, because uh, this is about for us about as scary as it has been. I've been here in Connecticut with charter six years now. And um, it's about as, um, yeah, about as scary for me personally. I, I look at what we, what we have and what we need to, to, to be able to do to sustain our program. Um, and this, this year could really kill us. This is not the year to take money away. And, it, and it's not just us, I get that. I'm, I'm on those municipal calls. And I know everybody's saying the same thing. This is not the year to cut. Uh, if we could figure out a way, another way to do it, it'd be appreciated. Uh, but for us, I think it's even more critical given we're already in equity funded. So appreciate okay. it. Thank you. I just want to be mindful of time. I know it's 227. A lot of us have a two, uh, 230 hard stop. And so I want to recognize that our Highville family is on the call. Janet is not to talk, but we do have our Director of Finance, Esther, on the line. We have Ebony and we have Linda Baylor, who is a parent. Um, Esther, uh, we'll, we'll move to you if you wouldn't mind talking. And Senator Winfield, please, I know I've been doing a lot of talking. A lot of us have been doing a lot of talking. And so please jump in if you have some questions as well. 
Hello. Um, I'll be brief because I, I do want to respect uh, everyone's time. Um, first, just really quickly, I just want to thank Jamie and Darlene for, for sharing their uh, perspectives. Um, that um, you know, personal story uh, is really um, moving and why we're all in education in um, our various different roles. Um, I also just want to co-sign um, John's you know, comments about um, this is not the year to, to cut and the impact um, that it would have on, uh, on, uh, on charter schools and on high goals specifically. Um, but in general, uh, the first place that we, we have to cut the biggest parts of our budget are staffing and benefits. And charter schools, you know, operate in a, a different vein in terms of really trying to have smaller class sizes, smaller ratios of, of teachers to, to students. And taking away that funding takes away our ability to, to do that um, in terms of having the, the appropriate staff. Um, the other side of the other piece of that in terms of staffing that would be significantly impacted that is super critical in this time is being able to hire staff for social and emotional support for our students. So behavior interventionists, uh, interventionists social workers, um, all those positions that really uh, work with developing the whole child, those got to get cut. If we if we don't have the funding um, to to support them, so and and now you know as I said as as you know as other people are aware now is not the time to not have those supports available for for our students. Um, we have had some successes in uh, uh, in terms of sort of switching over to distance learning, um, but a cut in any sort of cut in, in our funding would significantly impact our ability to continue that into next year because we don't know uh, what next year is going to look like. We think that it might be in terms of students returning to school, some sort of hybrid between distance learning and on-site learning, but there are uh, operational considerations that we have to take, um, that we have to think about um, in terms of being able to make that successful. Um, it would really be um, I don't want to be an alarmist, um, but it will almost be catastrophic not to be able to provide the supports that our, our students need, not just the academic supports, the social emotional supports, but also just sort of reacclimating them. There's, you know, a sort of professional development that we wouldn't be able to do for, you know, our teachers. Uh, uh, teachers were kind of thrown into having to learn how to do some sort of distance learning and, um, it would be helpful to actually give them the tools to be a little bit proactive to you know help prepare them for that and so those are all the things that just go away that just go away if, if we don't get that um if we don't at least maintain um what we've had so i know that you um have been working uh incredibly hard as everyone has said i know that you know you're on you know the right side of history um and we're just i think all of us just collectively trying to make our case for um just don't let them take any more away from us um, and then you know and and then we can you know begin to move you know have maintain what we have and then you know continue to advocate for for more um but i i, I appreciate your time and everybody's time yeah i hear you Esther, and and you know my kids over there so i can't even escape yeah yeah i know uh -huh. <laughs> thank you Esther. perfect okay. fight doesn't stop so please maintain us but we'll continue to fight and advocate <laughs> Okay, Shelly, if I could just say one more thing, Senator, you have just, just a couple of minutes. I, you know, I have spent my adult life working in, in and around government, either in advocacy or directly in government, and I can count on one hand, in, in half of one hand, the amount of times that, that the machinery of government has been focused on anything around equity. And that moment is fleeting, as you mentioned early. And, you know, for us, you know, there is there is currently in this budget, right, in this budget that was passed two years ago, there is an, there's $4.6 million worth, uh, uh, $4.6 million that was proposed to be cut by the administration in their adjusted budget. 2.9 million of those dollars would bring every charter student in the state to the foundation amount, the established minimum wage of funding. That's the, that still doesn't include weights that, 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 that this school population there's no other school sector, public school sector, that has 80% black and brown students or 65% low income students. Not, not traditional publics, not magnets, not Votex, not any of them. There is money existing in the budget today. It would only cost $2.9 million to get all these students to the foundation amount. And that's $275 per student. That wouldn't even cover what, what, what John and Esther are talking about. 
But the problem is that you know as well as I do, we're going to get an answer about, hey, there'll be some, some CARES Act money for you. The impacts of COVID and the impacts of, of the existing inequity are not going to be fixed in one year. And a year from now, when the focus is on totally something totally different, then we're not going to have the, the momentum to say, hey, get us to the... We're not, we don't even have the audacity to ask for fairness. We're asking for the minimum wage of education. And the money exists in the... But it's there. You know what I mean? It, it's there. And, and you can still take a million dollars away and it can still be there. Not that we're advocating for that, but I'm saying it exists. And it would be, it would, it would be altering for these schools. It, you, know, you, you know budgets. I, I did municipal budgets. This is a change that will keep on keep, uh, contributing uh, moving forward in perpetuity while, you know, not that we don't want the one times CARES Act money, but that's going to address now. And this is a band aid, always the solution. And I certainly don't mean you, but you know from being in government is a band aid. So for when the spotlight's not on it anymore, you don't have to worry about it. And we really need that. So it's not a cut, it, it, it's, not, it's not additional funding because it's there. Um, it's just being repurposed. And I know that. There's a lot of discussions about special sessions and budget later and what have you. It's, a, it's one sentence of the interplementary language that says the charter per pupil is 11,525 as a set of 11,250. And the money's there. And that'll go a long way to make sure these, these, these kids are at these schools. Because you know, not only do we have the highest proportion of, of students of color, we have the, by far the highest proportion of school leaders, teachers, and staff of color, as you can see, on the Zoom call, you know, of, of, of any public school, any type in the state. So it's not just impacting kids, but it's impacting our community as a whole. So that's my pitch. I can't speak, I can't say anything better than the students and the school leaders have said, but, but this is, you know, I feel a sense of urgency because these moments are fleeting and the opportunity is there and the money is there. Um, and so we appreciate your leadership. I, I don't, I'm not saying this to be flattering. This diff, all leaders are not built equally, you know, lead equally. You have not just a demonstrated passion for the issues, but a demonstrated depth in the policy and the seniority. So it's your type of leadership that we need. You know what I mean? We, we, we need your type of leadership because those decisions made in smaller and smaller and smaller rooms, we're not in them. You're in at least some, some of them, you know? And so we, we, we really appreciate that and hope, you know, hope that we can continue to count on you. Yeah, and I, look, I just wanna to say to that, um, you know, I recognize how quick this moment will end, even though for some people, I think they, they feel themselves in this moment, but I know it'll be over before we're aware that it is. And I've been doing a, some work, not directly on this issue, but just in general on the conversation about equity, about what is needed in certain communities, um, at least with the Senate Democrats. And actually, I don't know if you saw yesterday, they dropped an op-ed that uh, was about trying to, to, to frame the session itself uh, as a session about equity, about housing, about education in ways that we haven't talked about it. Um, and that took a lot, it took a lot of energy because, they, because even though they're Democrats, right, they don't all see the world the same way. They don't all see these problems the same way. And one of the things I've been trying to do is get uh, people who would probably line up with you all uh, to do that work in the other caucuses so that at the very least um, people have talked themselves to a place where they have to do something different than what they currently do, right? Uh, so that, that's some of the foundational work. But even with that, um, you're, you're going to have a, we are going to have a hard time getting people to recognize what it is to, to be in the street saying Black Lives Matter, but then to go into the building and make it happen in policy. Um, and and I think as you do as you do your advocacy as I do my advocacy, um, that's part of what we have to say to people. That was nice. That was cute. You were out in the street. That that was wonderful. But here's what it actually means, right? Uh, it actually means that you're going to do policy in a different way. That you're not going to have the the national conversation about charter schools when you look at the black and brown kids that are right next standing right next to you, um, who can't get an education because of you know, some philosophical question that you have. So uh, I appreciate uh, I appreciate what you're saying, Ruben, and I think it's the critical work in this very moment. So thank you. I, I just last thing, I want you to count us in on all the work, right? We're not here, we don't want to just participate in the education okay. work. 
you know, we, we, we do advocacy for, for, for the, that's what we do as, as a mission. And we have parents and alumni and students like you met and school leaders and staff who are, who are as committed to the overall effort of equity as we didn't come to this work. And I don't want to speak for everybody, but I've spoken to every, almost everyone on this call before. We didn't come to this work because we have some philosophical attachment to it what is a charter school. When I was a parent in Bridgeport, I wasn't thinking about which, I was thinking of good school, best school, like most parents do. We came to this work because we have a, 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 you know, a, a call to equity, to work on, in areas of equity. And so for me, and I know for my staff, because we have so many of these conversations, we want to be involved in, in, you know, whether it's testifying, showing up, you know, being on these type of calls for the issues of police equity, for issues of housing equity, for issues of you know, equity as a whole, because again, like you said, the moment is fleeting. So count us in, in whatever way we can be helpful. Don't, don't think it's just education. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Senator, for, for your time. Thank you all for being here. Ebony and Linda, was there anything that you wanted to add? Um, Ebony as a, a director of school operations and parent, Linda as a parent, and community leader, anything you want to add before before we, we head out? I know we all have been on the call for some time now. I'm not going to take up everyone's time, but I do co-sign, ditto, everything that was said here. Um, just speaking as a parent and just seeing the education that my four-year-old has received and up to my 16-year-old has received in, um, you know, at Amistad High and my daughter here at Highville. It's just really critical the work that we're doing here and we're so we're able to create a real family with keeping these low ratios of like teacher and student. So I, cutting funding and just thinking about what I'm trying to do on operation side with technology to make us one to one. Um, the, amount, the amount of work we had to do to get Chromebooks for our kids. Um, I mean, Ms. Clayton was getting donations here at the last minute. I gave out 104 Chromebooks and that took everything and we needed more for our students. And just, and now I'm trying to build up Chromebooks just to be in preparation for what can come this way so that we can have that technology in case we have to come into school and then go straight into distance learning. Like to do all of that is just, it's crazy. And then we're fighting the economy that's up in the price on every single thing. So you're trying to get a face mask that normally is 25 cents, it's now $2 for one mask. So just thinking about that and then thinking about Chromebooks that used to be 150, now they're 275 or 300. It's just a lot. It's a lot. And, it, and you know, we need our students back in the building as me being here and trying to teach my, be at home with my kids. I want to make sure I can send my daughter and son back to school safely. And the schools need to be prepared for that. So it's, it's a lot. And I just appreciate this time. I appreciate you appreciate you, Senator, it's just listening to us. And we are here for you anytime to listen to what we have to say so we can back you on anything you can do for us. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, all. Uh, Senator, we thank you for your time and, and ask that can we continue to count on your support? Can you talk to your leadership? Can, can, can we continue to count on your advocacy, your passionate advocacy for us? Yeah, you don't have to ask that question. The answer is yes. Plus, my son would probably kill me. So, yeah, I, I, I don't change easily. So, you have my support. Thank you very much, Senator Winfield. We'll absolutely be in touch with ways that we can support you. We'll see you out in the community, of course. Um, any other further remarks or questions? Anyone? All right, everyone, be safe out there at that protest. Have fun, and we will see you all soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.